we uh, foresee that in the next three to five years, we'll have quantum hardware available, which is outperforming classical supercomputers. <laughs> Welcome to Roll Right In, a podcast exploring the success strategies of thriving entrepreneurs. We believe that the big challenges in this world can only be solved by the courageous and the entrepreneurs like Markus. Welcome to the show. Hello. Thank you very much uh, for having me. Yeah, great to have you with us, Markus. Markus is the founder of Terra Quantum, a quantum computing startup based in Switzerland. Markus, what the heck is quantum computing? Classical computers uh, calculate with bits. The bits have uh, either zero or one as a value. Quantum computers are based on the principles of quantum physics, and they calculate with qubits. A qubit can have any value in between zero and one, and uh, by using two very fundamental principles of quantum physics, which are actually known almost since 100 years, superposition and entanglement, we can create a machine, a quantum computer, which actually shows an exponential speed up in compute power. And that makes quantum computing so exciting. If we compare this to the development of the classical computer as we have it right now in our living rooms or in our offices. Where are we at the moment in the development of the quantum computer? Probably compare it with the status uh, back then uh, of Konrad Zuse yeah, in the first uh, computers where we are. But uh, we all know that you know the development is very speedy and i think we can see such a rapid development of the quantum hardware also within quantum uh, uh, computing it's not any more the question of if a quantum computer works it works we know it we use it we calculate with it today it's just the question of you know how fast will we write that exponential curve uh, in terms of performance. You said that uh, quantum computers are already in use, but they are in a slightly different environment than we are used to our own computers today. Yeah, that's true. We, we, you know, we don't have them yet uh, uh, on our tables at home. Uh, so one of the leading uh, technologies for hardware is based on superconductivity. That means uh, we have to cool them down tremendously to minus 273 degrees Celsius. And that means that you have to put a fridge uh, around every qubit to cool them down and that of course makes it necessary that kind of the mechanical engineering around is still uh, quite big much bigger than you know a normal desktop computer today so but i can imagine that we will never ever really have quantum computers in our offices or at home but they must be kind of um, conducted under these special conditions how then do we get the quantum power out of these computers onto our desktops? Are there any special APIs that one would use? Yeah, before I answer that, I would not rule that out, right? That uh, we have a quantum computer sitting on our desk in the long-term future. Uh, there is work on superconductivity also in different environments. There is technologies out there which are based on photonics which would work at room temperature so i wouldn't rule that out but uh, agree for the foreseeable future we'll have we don't have that but uh, that's kind of easy to work around terra quantum for instance uh, has created a, a quantum cloud environment where through standard apis a desktop user can access our cloud and within that cloud he will find um, various uh, hardware devices native qpus where he can you know run his quantum algorithms on such uh, uh, devices so that is a kind of 
in in the cloud era not uh, not too uh, complicated. Yeah. Seth, um, <clears throat> you know, quantum computing was invented in the late nineties, right? Mm -hmm. So I, we have we have read d different things, but when you Google it, it's mentioned from the MIT and the University of Berkeley together, those two guys in 1998, right? So the, the question is, um, why does that take so long? You know, so today we have, uh, as we know, 2023. Um, why does it take so long? And the question is, when is it ready to really use in a in a in a in a long scale yeah so so it is indeed uh, already somewhat longer uh, uh, when it uh, when the first ideas about a quantum computer came up it were uh, in the 80s when richard p feynman a famous physicist and nobel prize uh, winner suggested that if we want to simulate nature and nature is quantum we have to build a machine which works on uh, quantum physics principles that's what uh, what really kick-started the development of quantum computers that thought uh, and since then it has uh, developed i personally don't think that it takes too long uh, actually to you know come up with with a machine which will disrupt almost everything i mean don't forget this machine once we have a true universal quantum machine chosen exponential speed up in compute power that will overtake sooner or later everything. Um, so therefore, uh, I think we are, um, yeah, we are progressing uh, nicely here. The hardware matures, but uh, yes, today the native QPUs are not feasible of really Uh, unlocking real business value yet. You can still only deal with toy problems. But uh, that's why we, Terra Quantum, have uh, come up with a solution to bridge that gap from today until the quantum hardware is mature enough to uh, solve real problems. We bridge that gap with a simulator. So we do simulate the quantum hardware. We simulate qubits on classical high-performance computers. And by doing so, we create the hardware platform to deploy our quantum software already today. And with this hybrid approach, we can indeed already today unlock substantial business uh, potential. And what are some of the use cases? Yeah, uh, in general, on the long run, every big data uh, topic uh, or challenge which deals with uh, algorithms in the fields of uh, optimization, simulation, machine learning will uh, be tackled by quantum computers. The, the general rule is the more complex it gets, the better suited a quantum computer is for that problem. And um, uh, that is also true today, that we look into big data, classical big data applications in these fields. Um, and there we'll find a lot, uh, also a lot of use cases we, uh, we, which we can address already with that hybrid approach. One example, uh, investment banks are a lot about portfolio optimization or Monte Carlo simulation currently tackled with classical algorithms. And one of those mission critical optimization algorithms is uh, the collateral portfolio optimization, a very complex optimization algorithms for investment banks to optimize their balance sheet in terms of risk weighted assets or liquidity and uh, funding uh, necessities. And, uh, We have developed here a quantum algorithm which we deploy uh, uh, on our hybrid uh, machine, uh, the simulator, and that leads to today already six basis points in performance improvement, translating into roughly 240 million annual recurring cost savings. And this is the order of magnitude what we can achieve 
today already. This will be also to add that this will be much bigger with a more mature native quantum hardware in the future could be, you know, 30, 40 bips uh, leading to several hundreds or a billion dollar in annual savings. But why wait for the billion if we can get the 200 or 300 million already today as well? So you, you mentioned right before, you know, you do this, um, this approach with simulating because you, quote unquote, it, the quantum computer is not ready yet. Okay. So how long does it take to be ready yet? And this question is uh, probably very important to all of us because uh, I think it was Financial Times mentioned that, you know, the nation that first is ready with the quantum computer will be the, the new world order power. So um, when will, so first of all, when will, will this happen? And do you also believe that this will be new, the new world power? Yeah, <clears throat> I think, I mean, the maturity of the quantum machine will, uh, you know, gradually uh, improve. Uh, so we'll ride this exponential curve and therefore, you know, you'll probably never be ready in a way. It will always get uh, better. But uh, we uh, foresee that in the next three to five years, we'll have quantum hardware available, which is outperforming classical supercomputers for certain problems. And, you know, until then, we bridge the gap with these hybrid solutions, also giving us a you know, a fair amount of uh, the potential, uh, which we can realize today. But the real kind of kicker will uh, come in with the native hardware as well. And uh, those, I mean, those companies or regions or states which will have a very performant quantum computer first have a huge competitive advantage. I mean, that's why this thing is a race for national uh, sovereignty, also for security and stability. If you do not have access to a quantum computer, but others have, you'll definitely, you know, have a huge competitive disadvantage. Which areas in the world are best equipped at the moment in this race or which countries? Yeah, we, we see a race uh, uh, particular between the US and uh, China, Europe trying kind of to keep up. Um, I would say it might be that China leads the race for now. I don't know about for a, for a year or so, but that is quite something in the IT industry. Uh, but you know, it's, it's, it's yet to be decided, so to say. Uh, and also Europe has good chances. We have great research landscape, uh, great researchers. We'll have to see whether we can get the, uh, our uh, uh, stuff together on a European level and not stay in the fragmented Europe. That would be a disaster. We have to work together here in uh, Europe. And then we'll have to see whether we will be able not only to spin out the first small quantum tech companies, but really finance them through so that the the value creation also happens and stays in uh, Europe. The, 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 all this area of defense was always, you know, a big driver in innovation in IT technology. And in this case, uh, yeah, that would be very interesting then to see what's, what's going on in this area. No, uh, I agree. Um, the thing with uh, quantum is, you know, it, this you know, security evolution, quantum security evolution comes in two waves. The first wave is a huge threat, a quantum threat to classical communication. Uh, uh, and we have now some years left to upgrade to a quantum secured communication standard to be safe from future quantum computing attacks. The end game is that a truly quantum secured communication protocol will never ever be hacked again from nobody uh, as long as the laws of physics in this universe don't change. So we'll see here actually in that second wave uh, a great mm, evolution of security towards a kind of a true not hackable quantum standard. If we talk about encrypting, 
then I think one of the concepts which always is discussed is Shor algorithm, right? Shor's algorithm. And if I've read this correctly in my research, it would take an up-to-date supercomputer of today, hundreds of millions of years to calculate this algorithm. Whereas for a real quantum computer, in theory, it would only take 100 seconds. Is that correct? Well, yeah. Uh, in, in general, this is the order of magnitude how quantum computing will improve or accelerate such uh, problems. Yeah, A true universal quantum machine will be able to tackle uh, problems where the best supercomputer of this world would take longer than the lifetime of this universe, 14 billion years, will do it in, I don't know, a couple of uh, hours. So that's, I mean, unthinkably fast and uh, uh, faster. Um, but yeah, the great thing uh, is that uh, a quantum encrypted communication protocol, because it works with entanglement, uh, you send photons which are entangled to your e.g. optical fiber line, that will be totally safe, right? Uh, uh, even the, the best uh, uh, quantum computer, which you can think of in the future, will not be able to, to hack that again. But if I think of a convergence of artificial intelligence and quantum computing with the power that you just mentioned, that must be incredible uh, with the implications. Can you, can you dream a little bit for us? What would happen if artificial intelligence, as we know it today, and quantum computing converge? Um, this is a fascinating uh, area. And uh, elaborating a little bit first on uh, chat GPT, um, uh, you know, I tend to say, although everybody's excited and it's, you know, bringing impressive results, Nevertheless, I would say ChatGPT is quite boring. Yeah, it's, it's, it's quite boring. It's definitely not intelligent because what we see here is, you know, classical computing. So big amounts of historic data uh, uh, are analyzed. We see pattern recognitions. We progress that in a kind of deterministic way towards solutions or in the future. That has nothing to do with real intelligence or creativity. The quantum computing age uh, will change that picture dramatically. Qu quantum AI, so AI on a quantum uh, computer has a very different behavior as the underlying quantum physics. Yeah, uh, The principles of uh, what makes a quantum machine work are on the single event character, non-deterministic, non-local, non-causal. That creates an element of <clears throat> uncertainty or unpredictability uh, with what that machine does. That uh, this could create something, some, something really new, something unexpected. And uh, therefore, I would see that QAI, so to say, is uh, is Chat GPT on steroids. Uh, expect great things uh, coming out of this. If we see something like the emergence of what you could call strong AI, I think it will be on a quantum machine. It will definitely be only on a quantum machine. How can humans adapt to this? Yeah, that's a, that's a challenging question. Yeah. <laughs> First of all, I think, I think that the human brain is a quantum machine in itself. Yeah. It's based on the uh, laws of quantum physics, but, uh, but uh, I think, First of all, probably everything which is thinkable here in this field, uh, it will somehow be uh, explored, right? Uh, I think that we should think carefully about regulation, how we could, you know, manage uh, that way towards QAI, uh, also probably control it. But um, to face the reality, I think a lot will happen there, which is, you know, hard to regulate or, or control. So we'll see something like this happen. And uh, then I think we'll, yeah, as uh, uh, I think it's an open question, actually. I think this is really something which uh, we have to watch cautiously 
uh, as it uh, evolved. Yeah, it seems like if we leave it out of the box, then we are forced to react somehow, but we cannot say what the result then is going to look like. But if we then get back to today, we see, if, if we look through an entrepreneurial lens, we see massive opportunity arising. You have your own startup in this field, but for young entrepreneurs who just start, who maybe are just studying at the moment, what would be some advice for you? What to focus on in the field of quantum computing? Yeah. Indeed, this the the markets will be just huge. Yeah, they are so huge that uh, we can have a lot of players uh, uh, out there tackling this. Uh, so it's a great place to start a company, uh, but it also has uh, challenges. Yeah, uh, the hardware play for startups is a is a tough uh, game because you are in a let's say, capital-intensive, multi-billion-dollar uh, competition with uh, American big tech. Yeah, that's, uh, that's something. Uh, the software uh, play, of course, is not so capital-intense. Uh, uh, that's a good uh, place uh, to be in. Um, but also here, the scarcity of quantum talent is really limiting the growth. Yeah, we as Terra Quantum have a... 220 people, more than 150 quantum physicists, more than 850 years of combined relevant quantum technologies experience. That is one of the largest teams globally. So you didn't leave anyone on the market. That like is another one, Skarsky. We need a lot of more talent being educated at universities. That's why we also cooperate with universities, giving lectures there and all that stuff to uh, uh, to educate the next generation of quantum physicists, and we need thousands and thousands of them globally. Um, it's a great place to be in, yeah. Uh, and then you have great opportunities. So when we have uh, young people at the, at the university, and and they are interested in tech, and they have um, a founder heart, what do you do you recommend to them? Uh, they should focus on at university. Of course, it's physics, but can you go, can you elaborate a little bit deeper into this space? Yeah. Um, so for the next few years, uh, you know, e.g. the development of quantum algorithms, so in general, quantum software or QAI requires really the deep expertise of a quantum physicist, I would say, uh, until this is more and more commoditized. Yeah. Um, so Definitely, the application areas uh, for uh, uh, quantum technologies are the ones I would focus on. It is uh, the quantum hardware, but it is the quantum software, which is uh, definitely something which will take over, right? We see that also in uh, the mature IT and classical compute uh, uh, industry, software eats the world, right? Uh, when the industry matures, software takes over, the focus shifts to applications. Uh, and that's why I think the quantum software space is a good space um, uh, to be in. And then last but not least, the quantum communication field. So the development of communication protocols to secure your communication is a huge and massive opportunity. It's probably bigger than Y2K as everybody who deals with digital uh, data and wants to not have it read by external parties has to uh, you know undergo his quantum upgrade so when we that, when we when we compare that with open ai you know so still this as far as we can read on the internet it's still a company that just provides this ai as a platform then they have apis where startups can you know focus on a special speci specification like for instance um they want to generate slides okay and, and they can then build an application that can make interpretations out of this ai um from open ai over the api in their app okay so to build that of course you got to know how to deal with open ai platform but in the end it's uh, still an application, okay? That, uh, mm -hmm. you know, you can use that as mm -hmm. a normal cons consumer or like a, a company. So do you guys 
in in a, a Terra Quantum, do you also have um, this model so that you provide a platform and then you have like partners or startups that work with a, a open API from from your company? Um, yeah, we have the the same idea in terms of the usability of our product, so that the end user very easily can you know identify the appropriate quantum algorithm out of our library for his use case, then do the specifications around his specific data set, and then have it easily deployed uh, using the APIs to our cloud on various uh, quantum devices. So that kind of uh, user applicability, uh, I see very uh, similar. Yeah, the, uh, the question is then, you know, on the usage of such algorithms. I mean, we and other companies who do similar things, we sit on the IP, uh, on the IP right? The, 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 we have a large library of uh, quantum algorithms where we own the IP. And of course, we will commercialize that. It will not all be, you know, open, open source. That's also in the security space, an open uh, question. We uh, have a QKD protocol, a quantum key distribution protocol, which we also implement with clients, which provides quantum secure communication or enables. Um, and here again, it's our uh, IP within the, you know, security landscape. You uh, sometimes find the opinion, well, in the end, it was, it's all open source and for free. Yeah. I doubt whether that, uh, a similar uh, a pattern will uh, happen in quantum computing. Uh, definitely not for all areas, I would say. So if all and I would be 25 and we have started our uh, startup, um, what would you recommend us to focus on in the space of uh, quantum computing? Uh, I would come from the end user, right? There's massive needs for performance enhancement in various industries. And I would come from the end user, probably in a particular vertical um, in some specific industry and to focus on their use cases and try to provide best of breed quantum solutions uh, for tackling such use cases. So really providing them an like end-to-end -end, uh, suit, uh, which makes it easy for them to deploy their classical use case in the quantum space to get better performance. How long do you think it will take until we see first consumer products powered by quantum computing? Yeah, I think that will not uh, uh, take uh, uh, too long, um, uh, actually. Uh, because there are fields also let's tackle the healthcare sector and the security of your personal health data. We work, for instance, on quantum blockchain, which will provide a, a guaranteed data transmission from whatever provider uh, uh, of, uh, of some uh, health um, uh, treatment towards the individual end customer so that you can be really sure your data is uh, totally uh, safe and uh, uh, private. We have um, uh, phones already uh, uh, out there, mobile phones, which have a QRNG device in, uh, built in. Yeah, so a quantum random number generator, which is uh, necessary for certain security uh, applications. So I think we'll pretty soon uh, see applications which the normal you know, B2C mass consumer uh, will benefit from. What, navigation or, as you said, health or what kind of use cases would you have on mind or what could you envision? Yeah, uh, in the, in the uh, route planning, uh, for instance, uh, I see that we will uh, very soon have a quantum optimized route planning tool which uh, then not only, you know, logistics companies uh, use for their truck fleet, but which will be open uh, also for the, for the mass market, for the individual uh, user. That uh, is something which I think is not too far away. 
So we hope that we will be the one who, uh, you know, get under control these capabilities first, right? <laughs> well, I think we have a responsibility and we uh, do engage in a, in a think tank which is tackling quantum for good because the one side of the coin is how will we actually regulate and control uh, this disruptive technology. The other side of the coin is how will we ensure that almost everybody can have access uh, to use quantum for good. Yeah, so I think that is something we have to think about that this is really because it will it will be able to tackle uh, uh, problems of, of uh, mankind which are really serious. Yeah, uh, on uh, uh, climate or health or security things, uh, another field of uh, disruptive innovations on in material science or so. And I think we should not have that. Uh, limited uh, in terms of uh, usage and accessibility or R&D uh, capacities towards a certain region, uh, uh, but we should try to make it available as broadly as possible. Thank you very much, Markus, for this very insightful conversation. I take away that we are at the at really at the tipping point to something great. We're bridging it at the moment from regular normal computing as we know it to quantum computing and its first implica applications. And uh, first cases then will be more B2B, but as you said, also B2B, a B2C cases might come in the very near future. And then maybe one day we can go to MediaMark Saturn and buy our quantum computer uh, for the pocket. And we have a quantum Yeah, performance. that's a good summary. <laughs> Thank you very much Thank for you having very much. me. Thank you.